uh, have a fixed number of uh, number of atoms in your system. You fix the temperature, and then you, you usually fix the volume of the pressure. And you can write this down mathematically. Um, in the constant gauge empty simulation, there, there are fluctuations in the number of protons in the system. Um, so this is considered a, a semi-grand canonical ensemble. I guess a grand canonical ensemble would be if I had, if I had all the, the species in my system were, were able to fluctuate in number. Um, and this sounds kind of complicated, but really all you're doing is taking a weighted summation of, of, of several different canonical ensembles. So if I, if I sum over all the different possibilities of all the different combinations of protons that I could have in my system, and I weight those by both the weight those part, the partition functions for each of these different uh, ensembles, then I have a weight factor that's proportional to the number of protons in the ensemble multiplied by the pH. So it's just a, a restatement of maybe a, a, a expression that might be more familiar to you using chemical potentials and number of number of atoms. The so where, where I have, I'll, I'll call X is just the, the standard uh, or the, the set of, of coordinates that one uses to define your system, the, the size of your box, the where the atoms are, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I'll have an, a new variable called lambda, which refers to where all the protons are in the system. Are, are, is, there, is a proton on uh, on aspartate two? Is it is is there a, or, you know, is this histidine and protonated or deprotonated? Lambda will just be a, a way of coding that. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, explain that in more detail later. Um, you can think of this then as, as describing as describing a, a, a network of, of different uh, different states of the protein. So in, in, in a conventional MD simulation, you would probably just pick one of these uh, to simulate, or, or, or maybe a set of them to simulate, uh, and you would fix where the protein, protons are beforehand, and you would run a simulation. So each of these little boxes here might represent uh, the, the space of a conventional MD simulation in, in, a, in a fixed ensemble. Um, whereas constant pH will now combine all of these together and actually interchange between them and sample them all collectively. So um, if, I, if I only have a, a couple of residues, so here, here this, this uh, example considers that I have two residues that can, can change their protonation state. So I can, I can lose a proton here, I can lose a proton this way, and I can lose, lose two protons, they can go all the way around. Uh, and perhaps based off of things that I know about the system, I can I can exclude some of these states as being unimportant, um, but that, that requires that I have knowledge of the system or that I think I, I have knowledge of the system. Uh, and in constant pH, MD, you will not necessarily have to assume that knowledge. The, the, the simulation will naturally move to the regions where, where, where the coordination states are most probable. So it's possible to, um, to, either, to either know this information beforehand, you can actually compute this information directly if you, if you what can, can do, for example, like an alchemical free energy calculation to compute the, the relative population of two states. Um, but that really only works if I have a small number of states. So you can also look at this as a, as a kind of number problem. Uh, if I have, have one proton that can change, then I have two states. If I have two, two sites, then I have, I have four. Uh, and I quickly get a, a very, very large number of, of, of states roughly on the order of two to the n, right, is the number of protons that I'm moving around. Uh, and this is it's very, very difficult to, to enumerate all these by yourself, you know, I'm going to write them down, much less know anything about all of them and know how they're related. So constant pH is supposed to solve this problem for us. It's supposed to, to sample this network of states uh, directly without any input uh, other than our, our force field. Uh, this is a, a, another way of thinking about this is that um, you can maybe regard the, the pH as a, as a force on whether or not protons exist in the system. So if, if I'm propagating my normal dynamics based off of, off of Newton's equation of motion, then I have mechanical forces so that there's literally a push on an atom. Um, the, the pH is, is in, a, in a thermodynamic sense, a force on whether or not a proton wants to be at a position on, on a, a, a residue or a chemical species. Um, this is not so. This does not lead to the dynamics in the in, in the, the normal sense, uh, but more it, it it changes the probability that I'm going to find a proton at a certain point in time. So the, the probability uh, that I find a a specific combination of protons on a, a protein or, or a nucleic acid, for example, as a function of pH is proportional to uh, the number of protons in that system times pH. So. Uh, and also mitigated by this by this shift factor, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, which is the, the intrinsic nature of, of, of 
the, the, the potential energy and all of that system, which is encoded in the kind of Um so how do we how do we formalize this? Well, so I talked about this, this parameter lambda, which I refer to as it's, it's a vector or an occupancy vector. It refers to whether or not um, a proton is or is not on a, on a site. So these will take the values of either one or zero discreetly. Uh, zero if, it's, if the proton is not there. One if the proton is there. Uh, you can break this down by, uh, in, for residue basis on on, on biopolymers. Uh, so for example, if the the first two Lambda is referred to with the two sites on the carboxylate, then this kind of sub vector of, of lambda would be uh, for, so zero, zero if the, if the carboxylate is deprotonated. Uh, I could have, have the proton on oxygen on one or oxygen two. And similarly, I, I, could, I could have a, a, another residue uh, called maybe it's composed of sites S and S plus one. Uh, that, so they're together. Uh, one, one would be if we have a protonated histine, for example. Uh, or either of the two tautomers that we can see. Um, so this is the way that we're going to, to, to formalize what state we're in, and I'll return to that again later on. Um, how do you, so you can compute um, the probability that of finding the, the, the system in a particular coordination state. Uh, you can also think of that as a, as a the time measure of the, the, the fraction, fraction of time that a, a protein is spending in uh, a particular state. Um, so you can just compute this mathematically as uh, a canonical ensemble average um, by essentially just taking the average of any of these given observed lambda values. So if I want to know what is the probability of time that, what is the population of a given protonation state, is I, I have to just count up the number of times that I counted a proton there, whether that was one or zero, which is effectively just the mean of that particular element of lambda. Uh, you can do more complicated things, so for, for history here, you could say if I wanted to know the, prob the probability that I have, I'm in, that I have this particular state, it's actually a, a combination of, the, of these two elements of lambda. It's they're usually very, very, very simple linear combinations, um, but it, it's, 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 it's maybe it's more nuanced than that. Um, the, the the trick here is that there are pretty much in, in this uh, summation here, there are pretty much only two kinds of terms. There will be the terms where the, where the particular lambda I'm looking at, or combination of lambdas I'm looking at, is zero, and which is one. So I'll, I'll, you can, uh, can just divide that sum into two sets of uh, identical terms. So this is one sum over all of the elements where lambda equals zero, and this is another sum where, where alpha lambda equals one. I know that all of those will have one more, one more, one more number here in the end, so I can factor out the 10 to the minus pH. And you can reorganize this um, this average here to get uh, a sigmoid, where I have a ratio uh, of these two these two special summations. So you can compare this to the henderson hasselbalch equation, and you can see that this gives us a the statistical mechanical definition of what we mean, we mean by pKa. Um, so now we have a, a perhaps unexpected uh, twist here, which is that this this quantity is, is formally pH dependent. Um, which is something that, that most people don't necessarily think about, but it's something that it's, it's always kind of kind of there. We usually just kind of uh, make an approximation or assumption about behavior of that. Um, perhaps the most often used self approximation, although maybe it's not stated this way, is to introduce what's called a hill coefficient, where you predict that the the, the pKa has a linear dependence on pH. Uh, so I have I'll, I'll assume that there is some fixed pKa part, the apparent part. So the pKa is apparently some number plus some pH-dependent factor uh, dictated by this Hill coefficient, uh, which is if it's, so. If this Hill coefficient were one, then all 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 of these terms beyond zero would vanish, and I have a fixed a fixed pKa as, as perhaps you might expect. Or usually n is close to one, uh, either slightly greater or slightly less, uh, and that that describes a degree of correlation with the other pKa in that system. So these are the kinds of things that you can, can compute uh, if, if I'm able to compute these, these uh, summations and compute these averages over, over a kinds of paid simulation. Uh, so returning to, to the, the network problem, um, so you, you can see that if, if, I, if I ran a simulation and you just counted the, the fraction of time it's spent, then you can, can compute these averages not without having to use um, these, these crazy summation methods. You can just compute uh, these averages as a simulation average, and then 
uh, look at a plot of, of that as a function of pH and extract PK information or, or, or correlation information uh, between uh, a given site or a set of res or residues. Um, so the most important thing here is, is, is the difference of the PK uh, and, 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 and the pH. So how, how near is it to the pH at which I'm simulating that will be the, the strongest determinant of whether or not I find a, a given uh, formation state or maybe set of states. Um, so that's, great. Um, that I, I just, that's a bunch of mathematical stuff that describes what we want to compute. Uh, so how do we actually do that? The, the two main ingredients are uh, the, the standard ingredient for, for MD simulation, which is that you uh, use microdynamics to sample a configuration from your given chemical ensemble. So we, we do this all the time. This is not a big deal. Nothing does this very well. The second part is that we want to now be able to change the protonation state uh, according to this pH-dependent factor. Uh, and then a number of protons in the system. So this is sometimes what people call in the statistical inference community as a Gibbs sampling, where I have two joint parameters that I want to sample alternately. So I, will, I, will, I can sample the, 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 the configuration first, then I can stop, I can keep my, my, my configuration fixed, and then try to sample my, my protonation state second. Um, and this is, this is just a, a general way, this is, this is uh, actually what you do in, in replica exchange if you're changing the temperature. You think of it that way, where the, the, I had a fixed configuration. I asked, well, what, what, what's, what, what should make your temperature be? I wanted to change the temperature. Uh, you can do the same thing with Hamiltonian hopping, all these other things. So this is um, a fairly generic concept, but it's, uh, it, it's essential to, to what we're doing here. Uh, so there's a problem, though, which is that if you just naively change the protonation state of something, uh, it's probably not going to be a particularly realistic way to, to sample. Um, uh, the, a new variation state, and that's because I'm, I'm adding an atom to the system, uh, and if I'm adding an atom uh, near, for example, on a carboxylate in, in the solvent, I'm very unlikely to be sampling a, a solvent configuration in which this is a plausible thing to do. So it, 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 uh, the notion that I'm going to have a steric clash or a very unfavorable electrostatic interaction between this, this proton, which suddenly appears out of nowhere, uh, is very high. Um, so this is the core problem in trying to, to, to create a Gibbs sampling algorithm for, for constant for pH. Um, we are not the only ones who have tried to solve this problem. There are uh, a, a whole bunch of other uh, algorithms out there. They've been kind of falling under trees for the past 20 years. Uh, I'm not going to say too much about them other than to describe reasons that we find them unsatisfying or not particularly useful for all sorts of problems. Uh, so the, the first problem is just to make the solvent go away. Uh, so if you, if you use implicit solvent, there's no solvent reorganization. It's just a continuum. No, no more problems. Uh, you can try to reintegrate solvent in the system by doing a, by using an implicit solvent as an auxiliary model for the system. Now you have to have two sets of models. You have to have, a, have an implicit model for your system and an explicit model for your system. Change it back and forth. With them. Um, it, this is works. This is what's what implemented in Amber. It's it's fairly effective for uh, particular situations where an implicit solvent model is useful. But you can imagine if I have a proton uh, a protein residue embedded in, in a lipid, for example, I can't really develop a implicit model for a lipid that I'm probably going to find particularly satisfying. Uh, so this this method really won't, won't work too well in that case. Um, another method out there is to have the um, protons exist fractionally at some point in time. So Rather than lambda being a, a zero or one only, it could be some fractional value between zero and one. Uh, that isn't clear from the mathematical description I just gave you of, of static as to what that would mean. Um, it, there are heuristic arguments as to that, why this is just fine, um, but it's still not, not particularly uh, clear. Some people just discard all of the fractional states, so there becomes a problem of that you're, you're discarding half, more than half your data just because you have some meaningless fractional state uh, in your simulation. So we didn't really like that idea. There's another idea that you can have discrete copies of this, and that just requires you have to have uh, a large number of replicas essentially running at any given point in time, given the number of protons. So you have a, a number of replicas that must be proportional to 2 to the m protons. So if I even had, like, I think it's if I have four protons in my system, I already need something like 1,000 replicas simultaneously to compute that system. So if I want to have a system, with a dozen or two dozen residues, we're talking about tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of replicas. Uh, I don't have the resources to run that, and I have access to one of the top ten computers in the country. So 
Brad doing that. Um, question. Yeah, in, in none of these pictures here, none of these documentations is the yeah. head of that I said the engine. Say the little one? Uh, like you, you've got uh, the Kaboxi data and what you want, right? You program it with Kaboxi. Yes. Or you get an uh, idle side iron somewhere. Yeah. So, so like completely elsewhere. Yeah, so I, I kind of brushed this under the rug during the, the rest of the talk. Uh, most of the force fields don't have particularly convincing models for what a hydronium ought to look like or hydroxide ought to look like. Um, if you think of it, these are dominated by nuclear quantum effects. Uh, classical forest fields don't describe them very well. Um, we're going to avoid using, modeling those by using uh, essentially a proton bath, where these things dis disappear. Uh, and then you can reparameterize the forest field in, a, in a, a, an implicit kind of way to account for those effects. Um, these are kind of hidden from the user in, in NAMI, and so they're not particularly important uh, from a user perspective. Uh, but it, it is, there's an additional parameterization of the force field that, that, that must be done in order to capture that effect. Um, if, if you were to have explicit hydroniums, um, there's also the, the additional problem that those are in turn coupled to the pH bath. So if you've tried to compute, for example, in a, in a small system, given the, the pH, how many hydroniums should I have in the system? Even for relatively large boxes of hundreds of angstroms, the answer is probably one. Um, but if I have two dozen, Residues, and I keep trying to push protons onto hydroniums. I'm probably going to have much, try to have much greater than one hydronium. Uh, so you're kind of this is actually a problem that, that the term implementation try, try to use. They, they partner all of the residues with a, a given hydronium, uh, and they come up with, with kind of specious systems where you have do, dozens of, hydro, of hydronium molecules in the in these solutes. Uh, so we're we're going to we, we just kind of circumvent that outright by by having it as a bath model. Does that answer your question? That's a little more detail than I wanted to give to you. Yes, but I was thinking about what the reorganization of hydrogen is going to happen. So, so the when when the the model will alternate between the, that proton having interactions and not having interactions, and the, <coughs> the water model will have all the normal force field interactions with that proton once it once it's interacted. Uh, is that? No more clarity? Okay, maybe we can talk about it. Uh, so so I, I talked about all, all I, I naysayed all the other ones. So we have an alternative. Uh, so the alternative is to to uh, sample this as a as a fast alchemical growth. So Chris talked uh, actually more detail than I thought he would about about Jarzinski type of, type, uh, type of work calculations. Uh, so the idea is to to apply a non-equilibrium bias to the system. To, to turn on the interactions with a proton uh, and, and augment the force field in a time-dependent fashion. So this, this, this is equivalent to, to exerting work on the system and driving it out of equilibrium. Um, of course, as, you, as, your, as your interactions get stronger, the solvent will, will, will reorganize in response, uh, and you have to deal with, um, uh, and, and, so for, and of course, you remove flashes naturally. Um, of course, you have to deal with the fact that you have um, Done this, uh, this, this, to apply this work to the system, uh, and the, the 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 trick here that, that again I won't go into too much detail on uh, is that you can if you keep track of that work you can use a metropolis criteria based on Monte Carlo to regain your, your equilibrium statistics at the cost of having to reject some of those moves after when you attempt them. So we now have a, have a, an accept reject criteria, and we've uh, converted our, our our Gibbs sampling algorithm to something a little bit more elaborate. So if I, if I begin in protonation state A, I'm running mechanics and I'm wobbling around and changing my configuration. At some point in the future, I will switch over to non-equilibrium dynamics, and I will change both the protonation state and the configuration. So that's that's why this is no longer a, a conventional Gibbs sampling. And I will run a simulation for what we, what we call a switch for some switch time. Um, I'm putting that in scare quotes for reasons, uh, and then we will generate some new protonation state B and, and, uh, and some, with some new configuration also. Uh, and I will apply a uh, metropolis criteria and accept or reject based off of how favorable or unfavorable that, 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 uh, that change was. So if I, if I accept, then I will continue on as if, as if nothing happened. I'll continue running um, electrodynamics again in this new protonation state with my new force field. Uh, if I reject, now I have to undo 
this entire trajectory, go back to where I started, and continue on in, in the coronation state that I was previously in. Uh, so in NAMDI, this is done with the alchemy module, so um, we have all of the uh, complications of doing that in the first place, or as usual. Um, so in a conventional MD simulation, we, we generally have single topology, and uh, the alchemical module in NAMDI uses dual topology. Uh, so the simulation will actually automatically spawn a secondary topology on, on top of your, your existing topology. Uh, so it'll duplicate the atoms that are changing. Uh, it'll, it'll run this trajectory by incrementally increasing lambda from zero to one. Then it'll remove the atoms that it used to, to affect this change because they're no longer interacting. Um, all these things are, are kind of hidden from the user, but they're, they're, they're kind of important to, to, uh, in understanding uh, the exact details of, of how these moves are occurring. So all this is done automatically underneath uh, all of the implementation, um, but it's, it's useful to know that's happening. Um, so, so, sorry, I'll just, can you go back to the previous slide? So, what you showed here is basically that orange lines in the previous slide. Yes, right? yes. So, so, here, so here's the, the end of my equilibrium sampling. Mm -hmm. I generate a secondary set of atoms, which I'm now using to, to build my for, to build my new force field, and I'm going to turn off the ones that were there before. So, the the important thing here is that I, I, during the switch, you have a secondary topology, but when when I'm done, I, I still have my single topology. And the trajectory that you will see in your output is still just a single topology trajectory. So there's there's no complications with using VMD to visualize your trajectories or anything like that. Um, all this all this nonsense that's just a bookkeeping measure. Uh, it's 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 happening, and it, it, uh, but it's not really relevant in terms of the output. Um, I just want to briefly introduce. Uh, the, the kind of the, what we call detailed balance conditions, just uh, as, a, as a device for, for explaining how this works. Um, so if I have a uh, probability of generating uh, or, 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 or being in some, some configuration and some probation state, uh, what, what Monte Carlo needs, needs to provide is a what's called a transition operator or transition probability that moves me from that that set of configurations and probation states to some new ones, which I will put y'all to know what primes. Uh, so this is where uh, you get, get the metropolis criteria from. The, the metropolis criteria will satisfy this equation. So I, I just need to have the, the minimum of the ratio of these two densities. Uh, so in in our, our our hybrid scheme here, where we have have these these non-equilibrium electric dynamics and uh, Monte Carlo moves. We have to satisfy this this metropolis criteria, which is just the minimum of uh, the exponentiated work that was needed to affect the change, and then also this this pH dependent factor that's also included in there. Uh, if you'd like, you can think of MD as being a a, a rejectionless form of this, where I always accept whatever the next move I propose is. Um, that's not exactly true, but it's it's essentially true for any any good MD algorithm. Um, so this is a fairly general concept, but it's but I think it's more important now because we're we're mixing in these Monte Carlo moves. So the important considerations here are um, are I guess there are, there are three questions. Uh, one of which I will not provide a, a perhaps a compelling answer to, which is the first one is uh, how long should I sample at the, at the equilibrium stage? No one really knows the answer to that question. It's the same, just like saying how how long should my MD simulation be? Uh, as long as you can make it. Um, so, so how long should I, should I do MD sampling at any given fixed creation state as much as you can afford to do? Uh, I will have answers to these questions, which is how long should I sample during that, that, that switching phase? So I, I, I said there's some switching time, and some switching time is not a particularly useful uh, directive for selecting simulation parameters. Um, so I'll, I'll talk briefly about how, how to select uh, the switch time for your system. And then there's, there's another problem which you may have noticed, which is that I, we now will run these trajectories for some specified period of time and then possibly reject them. And that's bad because I'm running expensive MD trajectories and I'm throwing out the results, and that seems kind of frustrating. So I'll, we'll first answer this and then hopefully uh, convince you that, that we have this problem also, also handled. Uh, so the, the first, uh, the, the trick to rejecting fewer, traje uh, fewer, fewer trajectories uh, was a trick by, by Yanji Chen, uh, who was a, a grad student with Benoit. Uh, he came up with this, this so-called uh, two-step inherent PKA algorithm, and, and so the trick was that it's it's very easy to compute 
the, the pH dependent part of that metropolis criteria. So if I, if I split the, the, tra the transition operator into two pieces, one which only depends on the protonation state and the pH, and then one which, which only depends, or which depends on both that and the work, which is the expensive part. I, I, have, I have two parts. I have, I have a very inexpensive part and a, and, a, and a costly part, which I can't avoid, avoid doing, but I'd like to, to be as sure as possible that I'm going to get my acceptance out of that. So if you introduce some estimate uh, of the PKA, uh, I will now, pr now propose the most, the most probable moves possible given my current protonation state and my, and my pH. This, uh, I, you will avoid doing stupid things like trying to take the proton off of a lysine when the pH is 2, or trying to shove a proton onto an aspartate when the pH is 12. Um, so, that, so this uh, makes the, move, the, the Monte Carlo moves that are proposed occur in the most, most natural and sensible way possible. Uh, it dramatically improves performance when, I'm, when I want to set up simulation across a, a very large pH range where I expect there to be different pH, different protonation state behaviors, different pHs. Um, so you don't waste you don't waste time doing 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 silly things. It also actually improves um, the efficiency of the second the, the second part, the, the switch part, which which is still based off of the work because uh, it effectively reduces the uh, the variance in the in the, in the work that you will, will observe. Um, and then uh, we, we recently all came up with an amendment that also uh, makes it even, even more effective if you have more than two states to choose from. Uh, so for complicated systems like histidine or phosphates, uh, you will naturally choose the, the most reasonable one automatically. Um, so if, if that was unclear, I think, I think this benefits from uh, just a graphical view. So if, 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 if I look at um, the probability that I have a proton on a given site, uh, it's just a, it's a sigmoidal curve that will that decreases as, as I increase the pH. So if I have some pKa, as I as I if my pH gets much larger or much less than uh, that that pKa, I will have a much lower probability of having a proton on this on the, that site and much higher probability of being on that site. Now if I have a proton on that site and it's supposed to be there, I don't want to try taking it off. So so the probability of of uh, Leaving the, I backwards, but the probability of leaving the proton there at low pH is one, and should fall off more or less exponentially as, as I increase. And there, yeah, and, and it, whereas if, if I want to pull it off, then it should decrease uh, as I go with low pH. Okay. So the trick here is that I should be uh, the quantity I want to look at is the difference between this pKa uh, and the pH. And so this is essentially uh, a plot of. We also view this as zero and a plot of pKa minus pH. Uh, so the, so the, 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 this is the parameter that, that we have to estimate in, in order to, to maximize our efficiency. So if you, uh, if you have some ballpark estimate uh, based off of uh, maybe experimental data or something like that, this would be a very valuable input. You can also come up with a guess based off of just uh, a reference cap on, so aspartate solution or histidine solution. Uh, those are the defaults in, 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 the, in the program. Um, and then you can, you can slowly iterate these and, and increase points as you go. Okay, so so that explains uh, the, the, the first question, which was how do I uh, how do I how do I avoid proposing stupid switches? Um, but now, okay, I, I eventually I have to propose a switch. What do I do in that situation? Uh, so you, you can imagine that there there are two limiting scenarios. If I kind of the zero length switch, then I'm essentially just going back to our, our solvent clash problem where I just blink proton out of nowhere. That's probably not a very good idea. It probably can be rejected. If I run a very short 10 to second length simulation, probably not going to get accepted either. If I ran a very long switch, that's probably very bad. You can imagine if I spent my entire simulation running one single switch, that it's very, very high probability of getting accepted. Um, but that's not pretty useful because I'm going to have. One, tra one transition from my whole simulation, I've just wasted maybe a week of simulation time doing a single switch. So we need to find some way to balance those two extremes. Um, so since the switch depends on the work, um, I will propose a, an analysis based off of uh, the work uh, and how it depends on, on the fluctuations in the force on the proton. So the, the, the proton, uh, the, if, I'm, if I'm turning on a proton, there is a 
there is a, a mechanical force that I can measure on that proton, uh, which is just essentially the instantaneous change in energy that I would need to, to, to increment that reaction, or that interaction, by increasing the, the coupling between that proton and the system. So you, you can imagine that if I had uh, an equilibrium uh, trajectory, this is going to fluctuate based off with normal fluctuations of, of the system. So there will be two parameters that describe this fluctuation. Um, the first one is, the, is kind of the intrinsic molecular time scale on which this, this oscillates. So this, just like uh, normal MD has, has a uh, statistical inefficiency or, or a correlation time, this is what I'm talking about, but it's for, specifically for the, the proton whose uh, interactions I want to change. There's also some intrinsic extent to that fluctuation, so some variance of those fluctuations. Uh, so we can, we can simplify this with, with, just for, for qualitative or, qualitative or semi-quantitative purposes uh, in a Gaussian model. Uh, but now, so I want to compare this now to, to the, 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 the switch time scale that I need to, to, in order to generate uh, useful moves. Uh, so if, if, I, if I were to switch uh, for any for a fixed period of time, I will get a fixed distribution of, of work values out. This is the, the, the Drazinski type, of, type uh, equation where there's a distribution of, of work values that I will get. Uh, they will generally be greater than the free energy of the transformation, but sometimes lower. Uh, and so uh, th these are, are, are the ones I want to increase the probability of because they, they require negative work, which means that I will always uh, sorry, uh, yeah, negative work, so they will always be accepted moves. Uh, I want to minimize the amount of time, uh, number of trajectories I generate that produce work values that are greater than free energy, because those will be very likely rejected. So I'll, I'll probably reject everything in this tail. I will, will accept everything below this dotted line. Uh, so it turns out you can uh, use uh, some simple approximations uh, regarding the the, correl the, the correlation of, of these forces, which will Give you the, extract, give you these two parameters, uh, and you can uh, extract extract these parameters, and you can get a relationship between uh, this switch time and and these other two times. And uh, so, long story short, that you uh, you will have if you, if you scan the switch time and look at the probability of, of accepting uh, a, a given move. The, the average likelihood that you are to, to accept the move will, will increase rapidly as I increase. Uh, oh, sorry. So the average probability will increase uh, monotonically with the switch time. So the longer the move, the more likely it is to accept, get accepted. But the rate at which I accept moves will spike rapidly and then tail off. Because, I, because I, the more time I spend running a move, the less time I have to, to run other, other attempts. Uh, so it turns out that this peak actually occurs at, at extremely reasonable values around tens of picoseconds. So a, the, a, a switch on the order of, of tens of picoseconds, 10 between 10 and 20 probably, slow processes might be on the order of 50 to 100 picoseconds. Uh, you're likely to get accepted probabilities around 20%, which is more or less what anyone expects out of replica exchange. Uh, so this is as good as, as, as most Monte Carlo processes do. Uh, so we're very happy with this. We, we, this, is, this method is perfectly reasonable. These are uh, these are normal perform performance metrics for what you would expect out of a Monte Carlo process. Um, and you, if, if you're interested, there, you, there are physical physical properties in the system that put limits on, on this value. Uh, if you are unsure, uh, if you have a more exotic type of coordination state, uh, you can try to analyze the behavior and, and see that it falls within these these uh, these normal behaviors. Um, but for, for, for most protein systems, uh, again, around 10, 10 to 20 feet a second is where you want to be. Uh, so how is this implemented in NAMI? Uh, it's implemented via a TCL interface, uh, which is now in, in the, the nightly build source code. So you have, you have to, to, to download source code. You don't have to use a source code build. You just need to have the TCL code from, from the source code. Uh, a copy of the nightly build is also included in the tutorial, so you don't need to download anything if you work on this here. Um, the setup procedure is the same as regular MD. All, all these exotic uh, uh, PSF changes involving these, these extra dual topology things are all automated by PSF gen. Um, this, wor this works with full electrostatics. That's the only way it works in NAMI right now. Um, it, it, I only put that up here because most other implementations don't work with PME. 
Um, that's the only thing we implemented because that's the, I would say, the gold standard for electrostatics these days. Um, we don't, it does not work with MSSL at the moment. Um, and also, it's not going to work on CUDA. This is something we are really trying to make work. Um, this is just because Alchemy doesn't work on CUDA. So, uh, efforts to, to, to do that are uh, underway. Um, there's also uh, an analysis script that will do all, all of the, the cookie book, bookkeeping uh, and produce um, uh, pH dependent behavior uh, if you have this from multiple, multiple runs. This is all described in the tutorial. Um, this is currently available on, for downloading from GitHub. It might get integrated into the Nami source tree. I just don't know uh, if we're going to to go down the route of supporting multiple software, software branches inside Nami. Um, this is just a, a sampling of the, the new keywords that you would have to use. So obviously you have to designate a pH for your, for your simulation. Uh, that's kind of non-negotiable. Uh, there's a, uh, a command that permits you to set the length of, of obviously, so I need to have two numbers. I need to have the length of the, length, the number of steps I'm going to run for M normal MD, and then the number of steps I'm going to run uh, the switch trajectories. This is set as a keyword, so you can set that value globally. You can also add additional selections for specific residues. So if I have one problematic residue that really needs to run for a longer period of time, um, you can use PSF gen style selections. So you, you specify a psych ID and a res ID, and then you can, can uh, specify those uh, directly. Examples of that are in the tutorial. Uh, and rather than using the normal run command, you now use this magical CPH run command, which again takes the number of steps for MD and then the number of, of cycles. So now my, my, core, my unit of simulation time is no longer number of steps of, M, of MD, it's the number of cycles. So one cycle will be uh, one switch and then one, one MD increment. So the, the length of the simulation is 10 times 5,000 plus 7,500. That's the, that's the maximum length of, of, that, of that any given cycle be. So when it comes to estimating your wall times, it gets a little trick here. So you have to compute a compute and maximum wall time that you can give to a to a uh, Q, for example. Uh, so what does the out output look like? Um, so there are new two new outputs. Uh, one is called the CPH log file, which just logs the instantaneous value of that, that lambda vector. So it's essentially just a, a time kind of series of a bunch of zeros and ones, uh, one for every single site in the system. There's also an, a, an additional restart file called <coughs> restart. Um, you, you, you just include that along with your normal recorded velocity and extended system restart files. Um, there's also an additional checkpoint for PSF and PDB information. Uh, the details of that information are not actually important, uh, but they need to be specified with the restart. So you, you, you can prepare a normal PSF uh, as usual, and then the, the simulation will generate new PSFs that need to be used at restart, but the information is is, is all is all the same. Um, that's just a bookkeeping problem. Um, if I were to run multiple simulations of multiple pH values, we will get what are essentially amounts to two titration curves. You can uh, compute, analyze these with CPH analyze, um, which is this companion script. You can also do it by hand if you'd like and write your own scripts. Um, it's not particularly terrible for simple situations for complicated. Many residue situations, it can be tricky. Um, so this is just some, some some sample data for a simulation. I'll show you in a second. Uh, for so this is a multiple residues analyzed over a pH range from, from two to two to eight. Uh, so you can extract P, pKa parameters and, all, and and residue correlations with the field coefficient. Um, so the the parameterization parameterization part that I spoke about earlier, uh, you see here. So uh, there are additions to the current course. So there are, there are intrinsic properties of the course so that, we, that you have to benchmark first. Um, these are completely done for, for the CHARM36 protein force field. Um, where it's straightforward to add, to add new residues. Uh, we're working on phosphates right now with the lipid force field. Um, so this, this implicitly models the, the hydronium effects and the bond, bond rate energies that are not captured in the force field natively. Um, so you are effectively computing, uh, ref uh, computing references with respect to, to, to this force. So these are very accurate. They produce experimental values spot on. Uh, in some cases, better than, than the force field would otherwise. So for example, the, the, the histidine force field is intrinsically does not 
compute correct time run energies. If you try to compute the time realization of energy of histidine in Charm 36, you would actually get an inverted population. You would, uh, the most probable tautomer is not the one that's experimentally known. Uh, it should be by about a factor of three higher. I think, so this, so this red line here is the, uh, the tautomer with the proton at the, del at the, the delta position, last time at the epsilon position. Uh, unfortunately, I think it gets backwards by like, but they're like such on top of each other. Um, so this is just a, a bonus that you actually can get, now extract things, the like tautomer information that the uh, course of di otherwise didn't used to give you. Um, so just to show you that, that this works in, in tricky spots, uh, I'll talk about some simulations actually Chris ran uh, using, um, so we took a, a, a small, a small pentapeptide and embedded an aspartate in it, uh, and then uh, dragged this in, into a, a lipid, so, so do, you know, the solvent relaxation is, is probably seems pretty, pretty manageable. People have been doing that for a while now. Um, but lipid relaxation is very, it's very slow. Uh, it's tricky to, to do pronations in there. Uh, uh, as you can see, so we actually are able to compute the DPKA as a function of, of the distance into the, the membrane. Uh, obviously, moving from a, from a high dielectric region to a low dielectric region means that it's it's much, much less favorable to have a charge, which means that your PKA should increase uh, because you want your system wants to have a proton on it more, but more likely than not. So you can see that uh, at far from the far from the uh, far from the lipid PKA is, is what you would expect from a bulk simulation around four. Uh, as I embed in the lipid uh, towards the, the center of the lipid, I actually get closer to uh, I think it's seven here. Uh, this all works with switches on again on the order of tens of picoseconds. Like I think I think the high the longest switch you did here I think was like 30 picoseconds or so, uh, and that's way way in here. Um, so these are not again all the time. Yes. What lipid did you use for that? I believe this is POPC. Okay. And the zero is like the lipid center. Yes. Uh, I, believe, I, I believe that's yeah. This is the bare center. So. Yes, it is. Uh, so this works also on, on, on big systems with many proteins. Um, so this is uh, many residues. Uh, uh, this is uh, the benchmark system for a lot of these kind of, these kinds of PA simulations is uh, staph nuclease. It's just a really big, boring lot of the protein. But W is broken, so I doubt this is going to work. So I'll have to switch. This is a little old. Um, this is a medium-sized system with about two dozen tetrabral residues in it. Uh, and what we're going to watch here is essentially just uh, we're going to scan through all the pH values uh, and highlight the protons here as these uh, glossy spheres. So at, at low pH, I expect to have a lot of protons on this system. And as, as the pH increases, you will see that the protons get ripped off uh, as one would expect. Um, so th these are, I believe, all aspartates and glutamates in the system that are being tracked. I think there's actually some lysines in there, but again, at, at, at this pH range, those lysines are kind of same usual, and, and the algorithm will respect that, even if they are committed to titrate. Uh, All, yeah, all of these products which are essentially in the appropriate state at this point. Um, so you can you can compare these things with experiments, and we also are referencing against um, some uh, values from the charm simulation. So our numbers are here in blue. This is a plot of the experimental PKAs versus the computer PKAs from titration curves. So you do a do a coefficient analysis, a lot of stuff, um, and we at least get positive correlation with, with experimental values. Uh, we're not always spot on. This is force field, not always great. Um, 
It also, so this is, these are all the, the aspirates and glutamates, which are most easily measured by experiment. Uh, I think these work with NMR. Um, of course, you can also get estimates of, of other residues like histidine and lysine. Um, but the, those aren't known, so I don't really know if these are good values or not. But they're, so, you know, this histamine is slightly more acidic than, than expected. Uh, one of the lysines is actually slightly more acidic, so this act was actually even able to capture a lysine. This PKA is normally around 10. Uh, it's actually closer to, to eight and a half in, in, this, in this model. So um, whether or, not, again, whether or not, not, not that behavior is real or not is perhaps out of a question, but that's, that's a problem for the, for the forest field, not a problem for the method. The fact that the method was able to, was able to notice that is actually kind of, kind of interesting. Um, so uh, with that, I will open the questions um, and before uh, saying that um, we're looking to obviously add things to this all the time. I'm working with a mods group to add and uh, support for phosphates, so we can do titratable lipid head groups, um, which are really interesting for, for peptide binding problems uh, and for the protein binding problems. Um, we're we're going to spend hopefully the next few months supporting DACUDA uh, to increase support for that. Um, it won't be as fast as regular CUDA just because alchemy requires a bit more, more overhead, um, so usually around 30 to 40% slower. So that's just uh, an intrinsic limitation of the method. Uh, other things that I would, would love to, to work on, but I don't have time necessarily to do it right now, so if people are interested for whatever reason in development re uh, research, um, we would love to support Drood, um, which we can't currently do because PSF gen requires improvements to do that. Um, uh, visual, visualization support is, I, so that, that movie uses, you know, you need special code to, to track all the protons. Um, that's, that's been very roughly sketched out, but it's not something we have probably available yet. Um, I can give you the code if you wanted to see it. Um, and uh, a lot of this, this CPH analyzed code is based off of this library of I'm working called Pynami, which is just a, a Python interface for dealing with the Python output files. So um, again, we'd love to improve that, but uh, that's the time for it. So uh, with that, uh, any questions? If not, I think we're going to. Post lunch or time for uh, tutorials. It's not time. Right. Yeah. So in this constant pH, like, is there an assumption that the bulk pH is similar to the micro environment pH? Yes. Yeah, so, so mathematically, this is actually, I, I think, a very interesting question. Is that you really can only define a bulk? pH. Uh, it's an open question for, you know, what is the pH, for example, in a membrane if, if I have a pH on one side and a pH on the inside. Even um, for protein, like on, on the surface, the pH will be bulk pH, but if it's a deep pocket and if we want to calculate there, it might not be the pH environment will be, might be different. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so the pH is, is, is as we formulated it, purely a, a quality of bulk solution, and it's assumed that whatever's coupled to that is interacting with the bulk. Uh, you could Im implement specific Monte Carlo moves to do like uh, proton transfers from residues at the surface to residues inside that. That's one thought of how we can do it, uh, for example, um, like proton hopping through, through a membrane, for example. Um, it's unclear how you would actually couple that to pH of X other than by the, the indirect coupling of the, the other residues. That, that's definitely something that, that we're interested in. in, in and, and the second question is like, uh, if you have a small molecule and you want to see the protonation state of that small molecule, so uh, you need to know the pK of that uh, a small molecule in uh, advance. But the the criteria, how do you set the criteria for a small molecule? So this yeah, this is another thing that that, that, that we definitely would love to, to work on. Uh, so yeah, you, you need you need a force field of that molecule, and then you need some you need some, something known about at least a similar molecule, uh, and you could benchmark to that. Uh, just because it's there's no there are very few well perfectly well defined ways to gener even generate the force field for all small molecules. So we haven't really gone down that benchmarking that yet. But um, yeah, the the the, the the path to doing that is is relatively clear. It is getting a workload to, to do it. It's something that we would like to definitely do. Thank you.